a human-ape hybrid, the stuff of science fiction, or a being that could actually walk the Earth? Or is it an unethical step toward a human monkey life form? Is this mad science? Is it immoral, even criminal? Or could creating hybrids now help us defeat disease and produce healthier children? I really do think that this is opening up Pandora's box. Will experiments with primates change the course of human evolution for the better? Or have we already gone too far? Throughout history, tales of hybrid species and ape men have captivated human imagination. From Hanuman, the Hindu monkey god, to sightings of the Yeti in the Himalaya and Bigfoot in North America, to the stars of Hollywood and the human-like rulers of the planet of the apes. But could a cross between human and ape really be possible? In 1871, Charles Darwin proposed that apes and humans evolved from a common ancestor. Darwin was arguing that humans, like every other creature on Earth, had evolved from other earlier forms of life, and that meant that we were related to other species. In the early 1900s, one person inspired by Darwin's theories was Russian scientist Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov one of the world's foremost experts in the artificial insemination of farm animals. His research was backed by Tsar Nicholas II, who granted funds for Ivanov to discover if such techniques could be used for the breeding of horses or even to create new species unknown to nature. The Tsars liked artificial insemination because it enabled you to do rather crazy things. So Ivanov created the world's first Zors, zebra-horse hybrid. They approved the project submitted by Ilya Ivanov and gave quite significant sums of money uh, in gold. Ivanov can now make plans for an expedition to Africa to capture chimpanzees. He turns to the Pasteur Institute in Paris for help. They've recently opened a primate research station in French Guinea on the West African coast. In November 1926, Ilya Ivanov and his 22-year-old son, Ilya Illich, arrived by ship to Conakry, the capital of French Guinea. Traveling into the interior, they capture three female chimpanzees. A few weeks later, 10 more chimpanzees are delivered to Conakry by local hunters, restrained with nets, ready for the forced introduction of human sperm by artificial insemination, the first two chimpanzees are brought to Ivanov. He recorded the procedure in his laboratory diary. The sperm was obtained from a man whose age isn't exactly known, at least not older than 30, not completely clear whether he had children. Concerned that local staff might protest if they realized what was being attempted, Ivanov performs the insemination, assisted only by his son. A few weeks after the insemination, the two chimpanzees were observed to be having periods. Things were not going as planned. It very quickly becomes apparent that Ivanov can't really accomplish the task that he sets out to do. He's not able to produce the human-ape hybrid by inseminating female chimpanzees. All Ivanov's female chimpanzees had died without becoming pregnant. His last hope now is to find Soviet female volunteers willing to be impregnated with sperm from the remaining male apes. So basically what Ivanov did, he, he gave public lectures. And um, there were many, many volunteers among them a woman only known as G. In March 1928, she sends Ivanov a letter. Dear Professor, with my private life in ruins, I don't see any sense in my further existence. But when I think that I could do a service for science, I feel enough courage to contact you. 
I beg you, don't refuse me. I ask you to accept me for the experiment. G. G is not the only volunteer. There is a considerable amount of enthusiasm uh, for the Soviet project in those years. It, it is just equally as plausible that the word volunteer was used with, uh, with some sort of room for interpretation. Back home, there is an even worse setback to Ivanov's plan. He cables the female volunteer, G. G, the orangutan has died. We're looking for a replacement, Ivanov. Ivanov's plan to inseminate a human female with ape sperm was no more. A new batch of chimpanzees arrived in the summer of 1930, but by then, Ivanov had fallen out of favor with the Soviet establishment. Women did not get pregnant, and basically that the experiment was finished, that was failure. In December 1930, Ivanov was arrested by Stalin's secret police during a purge of scientists and sent into exile. He died of a stroke 15 months later. He had all this, you know, passion conviction. You know, he, he was not a Frankenstein who would do it blindly. He was a scientist. But of course, he spent years and years on this project, and he wanted success. Back in Stalin's time, the country had lost almost two million young men in the conflict. Some in the older generation were searching for a fountain of youth. The early 20th century is this era where uh, people in European metropoles are, are obsessed with decadence and, and ideas of degeneration, right? We spend too much time indoors and, and working with our brains and not enough time, you know, doing really kind of manly things uh, that rejuvenates our bodies. In the 1920s, um, sex hormones were just starting to be isolated, and there was this belief that male sex hormones improved um, your virility and your strength and vitality in lots of different ways. Um, so there were efforts by many scientists at that time to extract sex hormones from the glands of other animals, insert them into humans, and see if that made any difference to how we were. Serge Voronov, a French surgeon of Russian extraction, believed that human aging could be reversed by grafting monkey testicles onto men. For those who could afford it, his treatments were all the rage. Voronov had trained in medicine and spent time in Egypt, observing how court eunuchs, who had been castrated as young boys, failed to reach sexual maturity after their testes had been removed. It was there that he got his inspiration for his great life's work, that using the testes he could revive uh, jaded, uh, aging humans. Voronov had realized that the testes were a source of something responsible for adult masculinity and strength, something that could perhaps reverse any decline in old age. For Voronov, the conclusion was that he could theoretically um, obtain testes material <clears throat> from a young boy and transplant it to a, an older man, but the material wasn't available. So, he turns to the monkeys, to the apes. This laboratory established near Manto is in an act of my laboratory at the Collège de France in Paris. In this general atmosphere where people feel that the human race is degenerating, that going back to a species that is more natural, that, that lives in, a, in an untouched environment like Africa, might be a way to discover something that would uh, give humans back their virility. Taking biological material from other primates and seeing if that might improve humans in some way. That was part of scientific thinking at the time. Flawed in many ways, but not entirely nonsensical because we do contain sex hormones and hormones inserted from other animals will have some effect on, on human physiology, but perhaps not in the ways that they always expected them to. And I can imagine that for uh, many of those interested in the biological sciences, it, it might actually mean literal biological regeneration too, yeah. 
Voronoff's monkey gland transplants were in fashion for 20 years, but eventually his patients deserted him. Voronoff's star uh, fell because of a number of reasons. There was one horrid side effect that monkey tissue can transmit disease. And we think that's what happened. We, we think there was litigation he may have covered up and paid to keep the, the matter quiet, but it's highly likely that that was the part of the end of the story. Voronoff's monkey gland transplants failed, just as Soviet experiments had failed to produce a cross between an ape and a man. News that a human-ape hybrid had been born would be shocking in any age. But in the 21st century, breakthroughs in transplant medicine could mean that we ourselves may one day become hybrids. Keeping embryos alive in a dish is helping scientists study the early stages of human development. But to better understand what makes humans unique, researchers at the Max Planck Institute in Germany have taken a step that recalls earlier dreams of a human-ape hybrid. They've actually grown a human-like brain in a monkey. Hutner and his team suspected that a gene present only in humans, RGAP 11b. The deep folds of the human neocortex give the adult brain a wrinkled, walnut-like appearance. Folds increase the surface area of the brain, allowing more upper-level neurons the cells responsible for higher thought processes to be packed inside a compact skull. If rgap 11 b increases the size of the human neocortex, what effect would it have on a monkey brain? So then the next step was to introduce rgap 11 b into marmosets and then to see how the marmoset brain develops. For ethical reasons, we decided to confine our studies to the fetal stage because we said we express here a human-specific gene in a monkey. We do not know what will happen to this monkey if the brain should get bigger. To have that gene be in a monkey line passed on from generation to generation, in my opinion, that would go too far. The fetuses were allowed to develop in the mothers for 101 days, two-thirds of the way towards birth, then delivered by cesarean section before their brains were removed and analyzed. The stunning thing was that these brains were folded. The marmoset, the common marmoset, normally has a, an essentially unfolded brain. And now suddenly, with this human-specific gene being physiologically expressed, the upper layer neurons were massively increased and the brains were bigger and folded. The discovery of the role that rgap 11 b plays in human brain development offers crucial clues to how and why humans develop bigger brains because rgap 11 b was an extremely rare mutation. It is probably most likely that this mutation occurred only once. We, theoretically, it could have happened twice or three times. But if we assume that it happened only once, then it is one hominin that then passed this mutated gene on to all of us. A chance event that led to a single mutation in just one individual that luckily for the human race survived long enough to pass its mutated gene, our gap 11 b onto its offspring. Hutner and his team have been extraordinarily careful to ensure that their research would not lead to a super-intelligent monkey. But now that the role of rgap 11 b is known, could a group of rogue scientists take this technology and try it for themselves? Could a sci-fi future, the world of the island of Dr. Moreau, of a real planet of the apes, finally be created? Could a small genetic nudge be enough to push the brain of a non-human primate beyond its natural bounds? 
There is always a risk of rogue, rogue scientists and rogue researchers, but I think more fundamentally than that, it's not just the rogue actors that we need to think about. We also need to think about what is happening within mainstream science and ask why is it so important to us to be able to tinker with the human genome, to change things? Is it just purely medical motivation? Are we really just trying to fix diseases or are we trying to go beyond that? And if we are, then why? In 2020, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry was won by Manuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna for CRISPR-Cas9, a powerful genome editing tool that has revolutionized genetic engineering. CRISPR works like a pair of molecular scissors, cutting DNA at targeted locations and either deleting sections or replacing them with new sequences. CRISPR is a powerful tool that has the potential to revolutionize medicine to treat and prevent disease, and even to change the genomes of our children. If you ask the public what they think about genome editing, you will find generally that people tend to be more supportive if it's in order to prevent very serious medical conditions from being passed along to children. But, you know, another family comes in and they're like, well, we would like our child to be six foot seven, you know, with blue hair and red eyes because we think that will be phenomenal. It's the same sort of fundamental problem, but in a very different ethical scenario. This ethical dilemma came into sharp focus in November 2018, when Chinese scientist He Zhongkui sparked global controversy when he announced at a human genome editing conference in Hong Kong that he'd created genetically modified twin sisters named Lulu and Nana. He Shangkui revealed that he had edited the embryo genomes in an attempt to confer the twins with a resistance to the HIV virus. I think everyone in the room was getting more and more horrified as the talk went on because it was clear that what he had done was very crude. It hadn't been done well. And there were more shocks to come. Well, we discovered actually also in, in after his talk, in questioning, that there was a third baby as well. Are there any current pregnancies with embryos that have been genome edited as part of your clinical trials? There is a, another one, but it did tend to monitor. It's what? There's another potential okay. pregnancy. Um, as to what's happened to Lily Nana, we know very little. He Shang Kui was released from prison in April 2022. The fate of the three gene edited babies, the twins, Lulu and Nana, and the third child remains a mystery. It's um, a big question. We may have the ability very soon to make a little tweak so that the person is a little more intelligent. We don't really know what intelligence is. I mean, if you're a basketball fan, and even if you're not, you might know who Michael Jordan is. And there's no doubt that on the basketball court, Michael Jordan is a genius. There is no doubt that in the boxing ring, Muhammad Ali is a genius. Right. There is no doubt that on the football field, nobody played it as sweetly as Pele. So there's all kinds of genius. And most of them aren't even approached by the false IQ test. So if we get to tweaking intelligence in the babies before they are born, what are we damaging? A century after a Russian scientist attempted to create a hybrid between man and ape, we finally have the power to alter the course of human evolution. But is humanity ready for that future? We've, in a word, played God with our genetic material. What will we in the end have done? 